love to be in your presence. There's fullness of joy in your presence. There's peace in your presence. We just want to lean into you this morning, Jesus.
meet us where we are. God, continue to open our hearts to you. Continue to help us seek you. Come and fill those places in our hearts. Lord, we thank you that we get to come communion with you, have communion with you. God, we thank you that you're close to us. We thank you for all the great things you're gonna do in this place today, in our hearts and lives. And in your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Some say that February is the month of love and dating. Well, here at ORU, that may be true, but there's a group of people that may have a little bit of a different take on the matter. Single people. Are you single? Um, yes. <laughs> you, you sound reluctant about that. Yeah. Are you single? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Why are you single? <laughs> uh, I'm taken by the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> have you ever rejected a guy? Yeah. Did you say, I see you more as a brother in Christ? Because th that happened to me. Have you ever been rejected by a woman? Definitely. They said, sorry, you're just... <sighs> and then they walked away. I am single, but I'm getting to know somebody. What does courting mean? Courting? Courting is like you're trying to marry them. What? Yeah, it says the people that court. If somebody's trying to court me, I'm not dating you. Don't use that word. Are you single? Oh yeah. We're all single. <laughs> it's not about height. It, it's a little bit about height. Are you single by choice? Yes. Is it God's will for you to be single? <laughs> good, you know, you get to be friends with everyone. Yeah, it's pretty good. But just friends. Just friends, yeah. That kind of stings sometimes, but you know, it is what it is. Do you have your eye on anyone? Um, maybe. Who is it? <laughs> do you believe in Ring by Spring? Because, no. because, because you know March is coming up. But what do you need to get a girlfriend? Money. So that makes m women expensive. <laughs> Would you like to not be single? Yes. But what's the person you're looking for? Maybe somebody with a microphone and a camera crew? <laughs> okay, Glasses. not quite that far. You know, I think I've given up at ORU. I've got three, three months left, so if anyone wants me, they gotta move fast. What are your stats? My stats? <laughs> I play piano. Andy loves Jesus. Are you waiting on the Lord? Yes. <laughs> are you aware that God is beyond time? Well, there you have it. They're all single and available. Shoot your shot. Morning, ORU. If you're having a great day, good job, video team. If one of your friends was in the video, give them a hand right now. It's hard to hear. There you go. Great job. Be some more stuff like that the next few chapels. We are starting a new series today, as Augustine mentioned, called Real Relationships. You know, our God is a relational God. He is interested in relationship with us, and he put us on this earth together. He's interested in our relationships with one another. And so for the next three chapels, we're gonna be talking a lot about relationships and what relationships mean uh, in our world. You know, we're, we're here together, and so we have to learn how to relate to one another and understand one another. John Donne, great uh, English poet and cleric, um, had a saying that uh, has been famous through the years. I quote, no man is an island, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls it tolls for thee. We're in relationships, and uh, this particular um, prose I um, already had in my message before losing a really good friend yesterday. But our relationships affect us. We are together here. And I, I wanted to ask a couple of um, people from our faculty to come, and we're just gonna talk for just a, a brief moment about the power of relationships, and maybe they'll give us a little bit of advice. Would, would you come on up, please? Dr. Randall Feller. Just stand over here. Yeah, come on over here, Doc. So Dr. Feller is a professor of psychology and chair of the Behavioral Sciences Department. And Dr. Andrea Walker is the assistant director of the Graduate Counseling Program, professor of counseling in the Graduate School of Theology and Ministry. 
Now, we want to just hear from two experts. Why are relationships so important to us, Dr. Feller? Well, 2,000 years ago, Jesus kind of summed it up when they were trying to trap him and say, what's the greatest command? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And we all know that part, but he kind of shut them down by adding this one little more piece that's significant. He said, for all of the law and all of the prophets are summed up in this. And so Jesus himself is saying it's all about relationships, everything. It's all about relationships. 2,000 years later, the behavioral sciences are really kind of figuring all that out. And what we see is at every level, whether it's psychological, behavioral, emotional, physiological, that people who are in strong relationships fare better on every one of those levels. And that no matter where you are developmentally, whether those primary relationships are just parents and peers, or later in life when it becomes your spouse and then your children, that those relationships matter greatly to our health and well-being in all those areas. Yeah, good. So, yeah, great. Dr. Walker, what would you say about relationships? You know, you're, you're with students all the time, now graduate students here. You're with the yes. older group here at ORU. But uh, what do you find among students, and why do you believe it's so important that we have good relationships? Well, just like Dr. Dr. Feller was saying, can you all hear me? You're right. uh, just like Dr. Feller was saying, we're all created to be in relationship. Whether we want to be or not, whether we like it or not, we are in relationship. And I, I just think that if we're gonna live our best selves, we're aware of that fact and we're intentional about cultivating those relationships in our lives. And if we don't do that, that can kind of lead down some problematic roads, addictive disorders, personality disorders, and the like. So that's your expertise, of course, Dr. Walker, is addiction. But yes. what happens to someone in addiction with their relationships many times? Well, there are lots of different perspectives on this, and there's a lot of different things that contribute to addiction itself. But some of our more recent thinking is suggesting that addictive disorders are kind of misdirected attempts at bonding. So when we're deprived of those important relationships that we need in our lives, sometimes the substance can help medicate us from that pain. Yeah, wow. So, Dr. Feller, what would you say to students? You're with students a lot. They're in your classes, and uh, you've, you've loved ORU students for a long time here. You've been at ORU how long now? 51 years. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Would you give him a hand? I knew it was a long time. Actually, not as a, only 20 as a professor. <laughs> only 20 as a professor, but been here a long time. So, you, you see students all the time. I've seen them for years. Uh, what advice would you give to this student body about relationships? That no matter where you are in life, you should be about the business of creating strong social support network. A lot of the students that are in abnormal psychology with me know that a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot Those of the, weren't the abnormal yeah. people, just the ones in just abnormal the students psychology. Just the yeah. Got it, okay, that's good. They hear me say all the time that many of the mental health disorders that we experience, we see isolation, loneliness, disconnect from people. And when we look at what, what are strong coping skills that allow people to deal with the stressors that are an inevitable part of life, or what are the things that once someone does have a major a problem, help pull them back out. And one of the examples we use, like for major depression, we talk about a lot of anxiety and depression. And for those disorders, there's been a lot of research that suggests the number one thing you can do to elevate mood and help out with that is exercise. Shout out for an ORU whole person. Yeah, that's fit, good. Fit person, okay? But number two on that list is a strong social support network. And number three, even though these are often secular studies, is almost always a subset of that social support system that is a strong faith-based group. Amen. Amen. Great. Great. Good job. So, uh, Dr. Walker, you know, if you had a student, just pretend I'm a student here, okay, okay. for a moment. What would you say to me about relationship? You're trying to help me understand that this is really critical in your life. So what advice would you give me? I would, I would suggest that, that we focus on one of the most important relationships that we have in our entire lives, our relationships with ourselves. Now, we can, of course, argue that our relationship with God is more important than that. But one of our most important relationships is our relationship with ourselves. 
And so things that we can do to help cultivate that, and doing so does not mean narcissism, it doesn't mean selfishness, it doesn't mean anything like that. It means basically allowing God to love you. Essentially, that's what that is. And so what I would suggest is to, first of all, be very open and honest about what each person is experiencing in any given moment, and then be kind to themselves in the face of those perceived failures, and then recognize that they're not that much different. Lots of other people have had similar experiences. When they do that, they can accept themselves more, and then that tends to be generated towards others as well. That's awesome. Good. Would you give our two professors a great hand? Thank you, guys. Great job. So love God, love one another, and love yourself, and know that God loves you, and uh, great, great advice. Well, today, in fact, the next three chapters, we're going to be talking about relationships. Friday, we're going to be talking about uh, female-male relationships, a little bit about dating and what all that means at ORU. Uh, next Wednesday, we're going to be talking about marriage and this relationship that's supposed to last a lifetime. But today, I'm really excited. My, my subject this morning, I don't, I've never preached on this, so you guys hang with me, but it's really important for this room uh, and it's a subject I've entitled, The Sacredness of Singleness. Yeah. Now, the topic of singleness has become ever more important in the United States. 42% of all Americans are unpartnered in our world today, an increase of 3% in the last 10 years. Now, less people are getting married, but... And more, po more people, it seems, are cohabitating, and yet that has not been enough to make up for how many people are now living single. In fact, for those 35 years and under, 61% are now living without a spouse or partner, up from 56% just 10 years ago, according to a Pew Research uh, survey. That means over 60% of people under 35 live alone or a single lifestyle. In a survey of more than 1,000 single people ages 18 to 25, a uh, group I do not recommend called Tinder found 72% uh, of the surveyed young millennials have made a conscious decision to stay single for a period of time. According to Darcy Sterling, a licensed clinical social worker and Tinder's relationship expert, uh, this trend for millennials represents a paradigm shift in America. Sterling said the group was saying, we don't want a world where people's self-worth is contingent on their relationship status. Pretty good statement from a really secular person. It goes on in an article in the USA Today uh, this past October to say, millennials openly admit to feeling uneasy about the idea of being in a long-term relationship. Waiting longer to marry increases the odds that individuals will be more mature, have better self-esteem, and be more prepared for the enormous compromises that successful marriage requires. Observer.com last year said in a 2017 census report, 55% of Americans expressed the belief that getting married is not an important milestone and leading to a happy adulthood any longer. And conversation.com in April of 2017 says, people who live alone are often the life of their cities and towns. They tend to participate in more civic groups, public events, enroll in more art and music classes, go out to dinner more often than people who live with others. Single people, regardless of whether they live alone or with others, also volunteer more for social service organizations, educational groups, hospitals, organizations devoted to the arts, uh, more than people who are married. Now, let me say as I begin this message, that some of these trends may be an attack on marriage in our society, but I think some of these trends are actually very positive to say that you don't have to be married to be whole. Come on. And so what I say over the next three chapels may seem to contradict itself, but I'm going to address each subject separately as we go. So when I talk about marriage, I'll be championing marriage. And today I'm going to be talking about the sacredness and actually the blessing of singleness. Now, there are a lot of people in the Bible who made history and they were single. Paul, Martha, Mary, Jeremiah, Joseph, Nehemiah, John the Baptist, and the list could go on and on. 
Now, I've got to admit, as I talk about this subject of singleness, I'm not exactly an expert on this subject by self-experience. Not exactly. Lisa and I started dating when I was 16 and got married when I was 19, almost 20, and did our last year of college as a married couple and have been married now for over 40 years. You ought to give God praise right there. So my single days are relegated to time before 16 and the few times Lisa and I broke up, okay? Yeah, she's shaking her finger at me. I don't want to get into that too much. It's Valentine's month, what can I say? Anyway, but... There are people on campus that are living a single lifestyle, some of them for a number of years. And so we decided to go across campus and just interview a few people who are living the single lifestyle. I think some, one of them is widowed, another has been divorced, and we thought they might just want to speak to you a little bit about singleness. So here we go to the video. I'm single, uh, never been married. I feel like it's much better to wait for the right person um, and um, even walk through a journey of singleness rather than getting married to the wrong person and regretting it later. It was never really something that I decided that I was going to be single, but I just focused on the Lord and did what he called me to do. I felt that I should uh, focus on um, developing myself over um, just being in a relationship for the sake of being in a relationship. I am currently a widow, and prior to that, um, I got married late in life. I was 39 years old when I got married. Having been married to someone who is absolutely the right person, worth every minute of wait. And I am single because I feel like I'm just following God's footsteps and going one step at a time. I've been single all of my life. Um, not necessarily my plan, but there's such a peace. I actually used to be married, and um, I've been divorced for two years. I was married for two years before that. I think that it's easy to say that my life didn't go according to plan. My perspective on being single has changed a lot um, since I've been divorced. So I think there's actually several benefits of being single. I am free to go do whatever I want to do. I've had the opportunity to travel internationally quite a bit. You've got a little bit more time on your hands, um, so you can be a little bit more flexible with your schedule, you can be flexible with the things that you commit yourself to. Freedom in decision making, freedom in establishing priorities. Focus on developing a very quality personal relationship with God. Based on the strengths of that, you can now have a more impactful relationship with others. You really get the time to invest in yourself and discover those gifts that God's given you um, because a lot of times you get caught up in your identity with somebody else especially if you're at a young age, that you don't get the chance to develop that unique individual call on your life. I would say the biggest disadvantage of singleness would be the intense social pressure. It's popular in our culture right now in that you're required to get married or you're required to be in this committed relationship at a young age. Sometimes some people won't take you as serious at times or you'll be questioning yourself of, am I doing something wrong? You think you're gonna be lonely for the rest of your life. No, I'm just kidding. Sometimes I have to get a little bit more um, just intentional in planning social activities or time with friends. Even in the garden at the very beginning, things were perfect. God did not tell Adam, hey, you have me. I'm all you need, son. He said, I know that you're built for meaningful connection. You know, that's the thing about singleness is finding ways to have meaningful connection. I literally thought I was gonna have a built-in best friend for the rest of my life. So whatever I was doing, I would have somebody to do it with. And so it's really important to surround yourself with great people, friends, your family. That's gonna be your support system when you feel lonely. My encouragement to students is, is really own your season. It can be really easy, especially when you're single, to just kinda of spend your days and your focus longing for marriage. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't fall into the FOMO, fear of missing out. It's really important to consider your life after college because right now you're probably living in the dorms, but when you get out of college and you have to find the job and you have to pay the rent and you have to pay seven different types of bills, 
like you change as a person. And I'm not saying that you can't be with somebody at that time, but if you don't even know who you are yet, you can't be with somebody else. Focus on growing the desires of your heart and being secure in yourself and not looking for another person to fulfill those needs. God has a lot of stuff to do inside of us and one thing we can do in preparation or in this season is to let God do an incredible, sometimes tough and uh, difficult work in our hearts so we can be um, the best self that we can be but reflect his image. I know that if my parents or my best friends or some of my mentors are saying something to me that uh, is uncomfortable, it's for a very good reason. A lot of times they can see things that you can't see because you don't want to get into the wrong relationship because it can definitely happen and it can definitely happen very easily if you're not paying attention. And never shrink back from attending an event or from participating in something that you feel like um, you should uh, be a part of because of your single status. Would you give them a hand? Fantastic. <laughs> Great insight. Well, let's, uh, let's go into God's Word for a few moments and listen to uh, two passages of Scripture written by single people about singleness. One is, of course, Jesus Christ, who was never married, so he could be in full relationship with you and I, and someday uh, we'll be wed for all of eternity with the bride of Christ, amen, and we'll be married with him throughout eternity. And the other, of course, is the Apostle Paul, who lived a single lifestyle and gave himself to ministry. Let's, let's listen to what both of them say about singleness. First of all, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 11 and 12, in the message version, Jesus said, not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace. Marriage isn't for everyone. Some from birth seemingly never give marriage a thought. Others never get asked or accepted. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you're capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. Amazing, you know, Jesus addresses every area of life uh, right at us. And then the Apostle Paul in what is perhaps the most prominent passage in the New Testament about singleness and how we understand a lot of how God feels about singleness is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. A lot of the chapter is given to this subject. I'm going to read quite a bit of it. First of all, verse 7 through 9. Paul says, sometimes I wish everyone were single like me, a simpler life in many ways, but celibacy is not for everyone any more than marriage is. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of the married life to others. I do, though tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might well be the best thing for them as it has been for me. But if they can't manage their desires and emotions, they should by all means go ahead and get married. The difficulties of marriage are preferable by far to a sexually tortured life as a single. Yeah, pretty clear in God's word. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 38 continues. Paul's saying, I want you to live as free of complications as possible. When you're unmarried, you're free to concentrate on simply pleasing the master. Marriage involves you in all the nuts and bolts of domestic life and in wanting to please your spouse, leading to so many more demands on your attention. The time and energy that married people spend on caring for and nurturing each other, the unmarried man can spend in becoming whole and holy instruments of God. I'm trying to be helpful and make it as easy as possible for you, not make things harder. All I want for you is to be able to develop a way of life in which you can spend plenty of time together with the master without a lot of distractions. If a man has a woman friend to whom he is loyal but never intended to marry, having decided to serve God as a single, and then changes his mind, deciding he should marry her, he should go ahead and marry. It's no sin. It's not even a step down from celibacy, as some say. On the other hand, if a man is comfortable in his decision for a single life in service to God, and it's entirely his own conviction and not imposed on him by others, he ought to stick with it. Marriage is spiritually and morally right and not inferior to singleness in any way, although as I indicated earlier, because of the times we live in, I do have pastoral reasons for encouraging singleness. Now, these are passages that are not usually read in most churches on a Sunday morning because many times the church has had a difficulty understanding that marriage is good and singleness is good. 
that God sees both marriage and singleness as good. And to whatever state you're called in, it is good if it is with God. If it's not with God, neither of those states are good. If you marry the wrong person out of the will of God, it's going to be a miserable journey. Somebody say amen. Amen. If you marry the right person in the will of God, it is wonderful. If you live as single away from God, you're going to be miserable. But if you use your singleness for the glory of God and turn your singleness into a sacred journey with God, it is awesome. Would you give God praise right there? So I want to give you just a few very simple things. I'm going to go fast. Uh, Just insights on singleness. Number one, singleness is good. God sees both the married life and singleness is good. And you that are single, God wants you to find contentment in your singleness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And Paul said, whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. Don't always be looking for something you don't have. Be pleased and thankful with God to God for what you do have. Amen. Number two, singleness is not less than. Yes, Adam and Eve complimented one another, yet both were also complete before God in their own right. You are to be complete and whole before Christ by yourself. Somebody say amen. Now, I think it's an interesting passage. Again, this is not read a lot on Sunday mornings either. But when you get to heaven, it is important to note that if you're married, you will not be in heaven. Whoa. Listen to what Jesus said, Matthew 22 and 30. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. The message version says it this way. At the resurrection, we're beyond marriage. As with the angels, all our ecstasies and intimacies then will be with God. In other words, marriage is a construct for the present world we live in so that we can reproduce and be satisfied and be sexually uh, fulfilled in many ways and and complement one another and be greater together than we are apart. Marriage is wonderful in this world. But when I get to heaven and Lisa gets to heaven, we're probably not even going to live in the same mansion. Wow, Lisa is excited. No cleaning up after Billy anymore. And when we stand before God, I'll stand before God and answer for my life, and Lisa will stand before God and answer for her life. So it's important for you to be complete in Christ before you ever get to marriage because you will answer to God for yourself. Amen. So singleness is not less than. Number three, singleness is sometimes for a season. Jackie Kendall in a uh, book called Lady in Waiting, Becoming God's Best While Mating for Mr. Right. Says a lady in waiting should be recklessly abandoned to the Lordship of Christ, diligently using her single days, trusting God with unwavering faith, demonstrate vir- demonstrating virtue in daily life, loving God with undistracted devotion, standing for physical and emotional purity, living in security, responding to life in contentment, making choices based on her convictions, and waiting patiently for God to meet her needs. Tim Keller, our friend in New York, says it this way to you men, men, and he, I quote, men, you'll never be a good groom to your wife unless you're first a good bride to Jesus. (laughs) It's amazing as you find contentment in singleness. Uh, Over the years, I've had a number of single people work for me, and uh, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so. I think all but two have gotten married while they've worked for me. I don't know what it is, so if you want to get married, come go to work at the president's office, what can I say? But what I've noticed in their journey, in their singleness, is they usually never got married until they got content with being single. Every one of them would come to a place where they would say to God, God, if you want me single the rest of my life, I trust you with it, and I'm going to be whole in Jesus. And then somebody came along, Because when they were whole in Christ, they were more attractive than when they were acting needy. Somebody say amen. Amen. Number four, 
Singleness is an opportunity. Elizabeth George, in a book called Breaking the Worry Forever, God's Plan for Lasting Peace of Mind, said one of the greatest advantages of singleness is the potential for greatest fo greater focus on Christ and accomplishing work for him. Peter Hubbard said, single Christians living in purity and community are billboards for the sufficiency of Christ. In 1806, there were five college students at Williams College in Massachusetts. And they were gathered in a field to discuss missions work and specifically Asia. Well, while they were talking about missions, a, a thunderstorm came up. And it was a, a pretty heavy thunderstorm, they thought. A lot of lightning, a lot of thunder. And so they ran, and all five of them hid under a haystack. Well, while they were under the haystack, the rain came. It really wasn't too heavy, but it gave them a chance to intensely focus on God. And they had a prayer meeting. Today, missiologists call it the Great Haystack Prayer Meeting. Out of that prayer meeting in 1806, these five single people formed the, the first youth mission society on American soil. Now, 200 and more years later, most youth mission societies and youth missions efforts in America find their root at Williams College in a prayer meeting by five single people who were using their singleness for the glory of God to take the message of Jesus to the world. As a single, you have an opportunity to be a hero for Jesus Christ and to give your life to him without any encumbrances, without any spouse or children to worry about at the present time. And I encourage you, take advantage of these moments. You're as free as you're ever going to be in your life. Use your freedom for the glory of God. Somebody say amen. Wow. And I want to finish. Finally, Singleness should be sacred. Now, this word sacred means connected with God. Something that's sacred is connected with God. And so our singleness should be sacred. The Bible tells us about a woman in Scripture who used her singleness in a sacred way. Her name is Anna. We read about her in Luke chapter 2. And I want you to read this passage with me about Anna. And let's reflect on her journey as we get ready to close this chapel. And keyboard, you can come, uh, Kristen. Scripture says this in Luke chapter 2, verse 36. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, or Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. We believe, if we understand this passage correctly, that Anna was married at a young age. She stayed married for seven years and her husband died. And for over 50 years, she lived single. She decided to turn her singleness, her uh, freedom, into an opportunity to serve God. She connected her singleness to God in a sacred way. And so she decided during those years, while she was single, she was alone, she would focus on a relationship with God. And she spent her time at the temple fasting, praying, seeking God. And so when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus for the first time from Bethlehem to the temple, she was there. She was seeking God. She had been faithful year after year, month after month, day after day. And in that moment, she was able to see the Messiah and have a supernatural revelation of who Jesus was and declare to the world that this is him, the redemption of Jerusalem and Israel. Now, the real question today at the end of this message, and I, I know it's been different. I wanted you to hear from some people on campus. I wanted us to laugh, but I want to be serious right here. Are you using your singleness in a sacred way? God has given you these days not to just waste them and not just to spend every day thinking about getting married. Now, many of you are going to be married, and I, I pray that for you. But some of you will never be married, and I pray that for you. I pray God's will in your life completely. 
and that you find contentment in whatever state you're in and, and that you decide in the time you are right now in life, you're going to dedicate your days to the glory of God and you're going to make your singleness before God a sacred journey, one that is filled with holiness and purity and godliness and grace and more importantly, one that is filled with Jesus and his presence and his glory and serving him and loving him with all of your heart. You can have a singleness that is sacred for the glory of God. Would you give God praise here today? Anna did it for over 50 years. Devoted, sacred in her singleness. Now I know there's a lot of needs in the room today and we talk about this subject. There's, I told the team praying before chapel, there's enough landmines when you talk about this subject that if I step anywhere it may blow up. So If I've said something that's offended you today, I'm sorry, I love you. But I didn't feel like we should go without addressing this subject. It's really big in our world. And people are using their singleness for all kinds of reasons and purposes that are ungodly and not right. Use the days God has given you to glorify Him. And as you become whole in Him, then if God has somebody for you, He'll work it out. Amen? He'll make it work. He knows your future. He can do it better than you can, and I promise you he can choose your spouse a lot better than you will. I promise you. You look on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. We'll talk about that some more Friday, and we're gonna have some more fun as we talk about that. But today, some of you are heartbroken. You've been in relationships and recently broke up and you feel crushed inside. You feel like you're less than. You feel like you'll never be whole again. And God wants to say to you, no, no, no. I want you to be whole in me because when you get to heaven, that guy's not going to stand there for you. You're going to stand there for yourself. I know it hurts. I know it's crushing. But God loves you and he wants you to be whole and he wants to heal your heart. Others of you are wondering, am I going to be single the rest of my life? No. But you know what you could say? Maybe I'll be single the rest of my life. If so, I want to be happy in Jesus. And I'm going to give myself to God with everything I've got. And I'm going to use my life to glorify him. Would you stand? Just bow your head with me. Father, I thank you this day for your love, for your power. Jesus, you teach us in your word that singleness is good. You told us not everyone will get married. It's not for everyone. And Lord, you teach us in your word that marriage is not less than singleness. Actually, it seems in Corinthians that singleness was rated higher than the married life. And that's not been true in our society. But Lord, today we we celebrate this state that we're in. And we celebrate that you're with us in it, Jesus. You know what it feels like to live a single life for 33 years, never married, never in relationship with the opposite sex, except as a friend. So Lord, I thank you for the grace you're giving our singles in this room, that they will use these days in their life to glorify you. And God, that you will give us people like Anna who will worship you, who will use their time to seek you, to, to long after you, to pursue you, and that you will give revelation to them as prophets and, and messengers of God in the earth and use them in their singleness for great, great exploit. Like those five students at Williams College, let dreams and visions and goals and and drives come to this generation and use their freedom for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a world-renowned and fully accredited Christian university with more than 100 undergraduate majors and minors, as well as graduate degrees in business, education, and theology. Don't wait. You can experience ORU's unique whole person approach to learning and graduate empowered to succeed. Visit us today at ORU.edu. Make no little plans here. My name is Johnny Crater. I'm a psychology major and I'm from Bixby, Oklahoma. I was adopted at birth. 
by two older parents. My mom today is 61 years old and my dad is 82. Uh, so by all means, I grew up with grandparents. Um, a lot of wisdom abounding within my household. The talks he had with me as a seven or eight year old is what started to begin to mold me in my faith. As a fifth grader, I wanted to do something more with my life rather than just be a little kid that played sports. And so I saw this program on CNN called Where Have All the Parents Gone? And it was about the AIDS epidemic in Africa. And I had just learned that my birth dad um, was part Kenyan and this was centered in Nairobi, Kenya. And so I just felt this tug on my heart to do something for these children. I decided that I was gonna give out free lemonade and ask for donations. And I set up a lemonade stand at Walmart one Saturday with a couple of friends and ended up raising $2,000 in four hours. From there, it just blew my mind. I was like, okay, I wanna do this for the rest of my life. Like, I don't even wanna go to school. I wanna raise money and help people. It went from just building orphanages to building wells in Tanzania um, and ended up amassing almost $300,000 in four years. So by the time I was in eighth grade, I'd built three orphanages, I had built 40 wells, I had raised $10,000 in tsunami relief, I had done $20,000 in tornado relief, and just all over the place with whatever I felt God wanted me to do. Then I was kind of stuck. Um, over the past decade or so in this recession, my parents had lost a lot of money and couldn't afford to help me go to college anywhere, and I knew I was gonna have to pay for it on my own, so I was looking at the cheapest schools possible. I participated in a Quest Whole Person Scholarship event but I didn't think ORU was even a possibility for me. But lo and behold, a couple months later, I got off of work and got a call from a 918-495 number. He said, um, I know you had talked about not being able to come to ORU for financial reasons and whatnot, but we want to let you know that we're going to help you out with that and that you're going to be a $20,000 recipient. And I, I dropped my phone. <laughs> and he was sitting there trying to like talked to me and I like was scrambling to pick up the phone but tears were like welling up in my eyes because once again like God was showing me that he loves me tremendously he loves all of us tremendously and so um, through everything I've been through everything I've walked through and seen now I get to go to the school and pursue a bachelor's in psychology and then a master's in Christian counseling and not being uh, overwhelmingly in debt and I get to have a great roommate and I get to have this great community. To people that donate towards scholarship programs, just know that if you, even if you don't see that money working physically, that there's someone like me or like anyone else that's ever received a scholarship that knows that that helps them tremendously and, and so they're not only funding a person or funding a school, that money is funding a dream, it's funding a reality and an ability for that person to go and do what God has called them to do.